Hello, hello, step right up and see the beautifully morbid displays of Frederick Reusch. 17th century Dutch art was obsessed with depicting reality and the world's hidden layers. Since art and anatomy went hand in hand at the time, anatomical depictions needed to embody artistic qualities while remaining scientifically informative. Theatrical displays were, therefore, common in the new world of science and dissection. These theatrics were so prevalent that medical performances were staged with the goal of drawing attention, all while maintaining a professional image. Anatomy lessons fictionalized their narratives, attempting to turn their gory subject into a pleasing aesthetic. The anatomic practice had become stuffed with themes of emblematic morality. Using the theatrics of art, the practice of anatomy gained an elevation of status. Paintings commemorated public anatomical demonstrations and reminded guild members, magistrates, and city governors of the prestige that encompassed the anatomical guilds. The act of dissection itself was presented, often through art, as a noble enterprise for the public to consume. Artists often dramatized such paintings using monochromatic palettes and chiaroscuro. In the Netherlands, the study of human corpses was illegal until 1555, when male bodies were allowed to be dissected. It wasn't until the late 17th century that the dissection of female bodies was legalized. The Dutch government didn't want the Surgeon's Guild to solely handle anatomy lessons, so one doctor was appointed to the post of Prelector, or City Anatomist. This was, of course, a coveted position among doctors because it provided power, financial gain, and an important role within the civil community. The city anatomist was the only individual allowed to act as a demonstrator during public anatomy lessons. The city anatomist was allowed to perform a certain number of dissections a year, one of which had to be open to the public. Public anatomy lessons were performed annually in cities like Amsterdam, Leiden, and Delft. The general population would buy tickets in order to get a glimpse at the secrets of nature. These tickets would pay for banquets served after dissections to the surgeons. Welcome to the Anatomy Theater, an important center for culture and science. The Anatomy Theater would house anatomy lessons that were a societal attraction of sorts, a showcase for the specialized expertise of the prelector. Light would come from scented candles or windows, and sometimes a flutist would play music. Not the setting you'd think of when you think of dissections nowadays. Leiden's Anatomy Theater gave their anatomy lessons literary meanings in order to relieve any tension that the dissection might cause, leaning into the theatricality that attracts tourists. The cadavers were usually criminals or travelers who would not be missed, but the subject had to be from outside the city, and the Surgeon's Guild was required to pay for the subject's church burial following the dissection. But what were the anatomical theaters doing when dissections weren't happening? Anatomical theaters were home to anatomical cabinets and archives of art prints, artifacts, and scientific instruments that were on display for the public. It was the original Oddity Museum. Collections featured skeletons and organs that had been prepared for display. These remains or prepared body parts of criminals weren't just for show. They were meant to remind the viewer of the punishments that followed antisocial behavior. Basically, don't become a criminal or you will have your head in a jar. Now it's time to talk about Vanitas imagery. Vanitas imagery is meant to make the viewer reflect upon their own mortality and the vanity of earthly possessions. In Leiden, artists developed the Vanitas still life genre, painting skulls, bones, hourglasses, extinguished candles, wilting flowers, and other objects that show fragility in the face of death. Objects that symbolized luxury were placed beside representations of death in order to teach the meaningless nature of worldly goods. Leiden's Anatomy Theater was famous and produced guidebooks to their collection that explained the morals behind anatomical arrangements. The skeletons of criminals sentenced to death were placed in the circle of the theater, so they embodied Vanitas imagery, serving a purpose beyond their death sentence and public dissection. Some skeletons held flags with mottos that mentioned mortality. Leiden's collection included mummies, zoological specimens, shells, and horns.
This is Frederick Reusch. He lived and worked during the Netherlands Enlightenment era, a prime time for dissection. In 1664, Reusch earned his medical degree from the University of Leiden. Just two years later, he occupied the role of Amsterdam's city anatomist. From that time until his death in 1731, Reusch was an anatomist, surgeon, and obstetrician. His reign as city anatomist lasted almost 60 years. Not only was his reign long, it was active. Reusch took part in 31 public dissections. Frederick's lessons were famous and were attended by notable individuals such as diplomats and royalty. Furthermore, his lessons were often more festive than average. Once again, not what we think of as dissection today. Reusch's legacy had been carved out through the aesthetic quality of his anatomical demonstrations, a quality that was made possible by his own improvements upon embalming and preservation methods. With these improved methods, Reusch was able to portray a defiance of death, a body refusing to decompose. Allow me to explain. From 1661 to 1664, Reusch studied for his medical degree and came across the skeletons and specimens featured in Leiden University's anatomy theater. Once Reusch was prelector or city anatomist and head obstetrician in Amsterdam, he looked to Leiden's Venetus models for inspiration, creating his own anatomical cabinet in 1673. But here's the big difference. The Leiden collection was assembled by multiple people, while Reusch's was his creation alone. He did everything from the preparation to the construction of his displays. Reusch's cabinet of curiosities portrayed a macabre fantasy of fetal skeletons playing violins. The cabinet displays focused on a theme of mortality while appealing to the aesthetic trends of 17th century Dutch still lifes. Multiple objects were thrown together to form scenes of aesthetic chaos, commonly seen in still lives at the time. These displays meant more than the popularized moral references. But how did Reusch preserve his specimens so well? Reusch had come up with a new embalming technique to preserve his anatomical collection. Syringe injections preserved body parts and gave the dead flesh a living quality. The fluids injected were a mixture of talc, wax, cinnabar, lavender oil, and colored pigments. This replaced perishable bodily fluids. After injection, the specimen was placed in a jar that contained liquor balsamicus, which is Nantic brandy and black pepper. This prevented decomposition. Reusch's preservation process was revolutionary, allowing for bloodless dissection that reduced the smell of decaying flesh and made the corpse less gruesome looking. With Reusch's technique, corpses could be kept prior to a lesson, and lessons would no longer be restricted to colder months. By 1690, Reusch's cabinet had become very popular and was visited by foreign dignitaries. One French gentleman who had visited the cabinet wrote that Reusch's education made him appear to be a nobleman. But Reusch was not just a scientist and educator, he was an artist. He created complex compositions that were decorated with natural objects. He went even farther by adding classical poetry that hinted at the meaning of his compositions. An inventory of Reusch's work was published in 1691, followed by a catalog collection in 1717, featuring illustrations by C. H. Huyberts. A complete collection of Reusch's medical writings was published in 1720, along with the accompanying illustrations. Let's look at an example. In this illustration of Reusch's display, fetal skeletons are placed among a mountain of gallstones and vascular trees. The skeleton in the bottom right is holding a handkerchief made of lung tissue. The text that accompanies this image reads, Why should I long for the things of this world? Death spares no man, not even the defenseless infant. Really hitting home those Vanitas morals. Most of Reusch's anatomical art features the remains of fetuses and infants. Among 600 specimens, one third of his collection features the bodies of infants. You may be wondering how this man had access to all these dead infants. Reusch was the supervisor of the city's midwives, and he would buy most of the bodies from them. It is most likely that the children were stillborn, but I wasn't there. Now comes the question of why infants. 
Small fetal skeletons played into Vanitas imagery, reminding the viewer of human frailty. Infant bodies created an aesthetic that sat at the crossroads of demonstration and the qualities of Vanitas art. These infants embodied virtue, since they did not get a chance to develop any vices. They are, due to their premature death, pure. This purity and portrayal of tragic innocence provided food for thought, a compelling spectacle. Sometimes, Roish would embalm and dress the bodies or body parts, placing them on shelves to contrast morbid and ornamental aesthetics. Using infant and fetus corpses also displayed Roish's skill in handling fragile subjects, emphasizing his status as an artist. The preserved infants had become an outlet for deep thought and reflection rather than individual corpses. They were no longer human, they were art. Believe it or not, Roish was one of the more optimistic ones. He attempted to defend against the fear of death by creating anatomic works of art that would live on forever. Roish did not, unlike some of his contemporaries, collect specimens with deformities, such as conjoined twins. Instead, he depicted idealized realities that reanimated the subject. Just like artists at the time, Roish gave his specimens lively and emotive qualities, a real-life Frankenstein. As an example, here is an image of an infant head that he preserved with glass eyes. The eyes portray a non-existent consciousness and therefore elicits an emotional response. Roish was skilled in making dead tissue appear to be alive. His art had become too impressive to be labeled mere craft. Roish was almost mythical. Some stated that he had the power to resurrect the dead. Signs of dismemberment were hid with clothing. Limbs were arranged in poses to hide traces of rigor mortis, and corpses were treated with colored pigments in warm wax to create the illusion of living flesh. Thanks to Roish, anatomical art was considered as important as fine craftwork and painting. Roish's displays were seen as genuine works of art and were sold to prominent figures such as Peter the Great, Tsar of Russia. Roish's extraordinarily preserved corpses were recorded in paintings of his anatomy lessons. In these paintings, the cadaver appeared fresh and alive, mostly bloodless, except for the area that depicted the well-preserved oxygenated red blood. In contrast to other anatomical paintings, which displayed how dead the corpse was, paintings of Roish's lessons were about his ability to bring corpses to life. 